I think we're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. I want to be respectful of, of people's time. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone here today to uh, this um, panel discussion or uh, community discussion on stress testing the multi-stakeholder model in cybersecurity. Uh, my name is Sally Wentworth. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy at the Internet Society, and I'm joined here by a very esteemed panel, plus um, uh, in addition to a person, Dominique uh, Lazansky, who's coming in uh, remotely. I thought I would just do a quick test, Dominique, and make sure that you are able to weigh in and speak up and that we can hear you. Yes, hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hello, Dominique, it's great to hear hi. you. Hi. Hi, very good. So we have a, uh, this is always the worst, the most difficult session right after lunch, so we're going to try to keep everyone engaged and interested. Um, uh, this session, as I said, is called Stress Testing the Multi-Stakeholder Model in Cybersecurity. Uh, yesterday, there was a, a plenary session on, um, uh, on, on multi-stakeholder governance in cyberspace. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? Hello? We have multiple people. I guess I should use this opportunity to pause for a moment and um, make sure everybody Jeff. knows. Uh, yeah, you are Sarah for Lovely. this panel. It's you always wanted great to be here. I think we're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. I want to oh, be respectful you're playing this back. of people's time. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. I do like the sound of my voice. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, don't comment. <laughs> Uh, before I get going into the panel description, I do want to introduce my co-moderator here, Tatiana. Do you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. Do you want to say more about yourself? Uh, yeah, thank you, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tatiana Trupina. I'm from Max Planck Institute, Germany. Very nice. And uh, Tatiana is going to um, help me make sure that this is as interactive a session as possible. So we really do hope that we get a conversation going here. Um, and that um, we uh, come out with a, a very kind of pragmatic view of this issue of the multi-stakeholder model and cybersecurity. So um, the way that we'll structure this session is we'll um, have a bit of a dialogue with the, the panelists here and Dominique online. And then we really um, want to turn it over to uh, the room and have a, a conversation that can probably go in any number of directions. Um, so as I mentioned yesterday, there was a session on cybersecurity, and I, it was quite interesting. I was um, on the session with Tatiana. We're like the dynamic duo this week. Um, and uh, there was a perspective that seemed to come through that um, session, which was that governments have a leading role when it comes to issues of cybersecurity. And certainly there was uh, differing views in the group, but that was a, a perspective that came forward um, very clearly. And I will admit that I was a bit surprised that that was um, quite as strongly held a point of view. Um, on the other hand, we in the internet community have been speaking for some uh, time about the quote unquote multi-stakeholder model, this notion that um, to provide, to develop solutions in cyberspace, in the internet space, we need uh, to bring all stakeholders together um, and that there's a, a role to play for various expertise to come to solid, robust, sustainable solutions. Um, but it's been my experience and perhaps others uh, have similar experience um, that as of late, as we've moved into an environment where security is the issue of the day, where cybersecurity, however defined, and that's probably a topic for conversation, is how do we define this term because it means a lot of things to a lot of people, um, that that is uh, cybersecurity issues, issues of, um, uh, of security in general relate to national security, to law enforcement, and that those are serious issues for serious people. And that the multi-stakeholder model, however nice it may be, um, is often not the, the model that you hear about when it comes to dealing with issues that are seen to be serious cybersecurity. 
And so I think the question that I would like to grapple with today is, do we accept that point of view? You know, do we accept the, this notion that uh, the multi-stakeholder model may be good for some things, but when it comes to issues of security, uh, perhaps it's not ready? Or, in fact, um, is this idea of, of bringing stakeholders together to solve problems still valid and relevant in issues related to security and related to cybersecurity? And if it is relevant, do we have very practical examples of how that's working? Uh, do we, uh, can we have a conversation about uh, what are the pros, what are the cons, what are the shortcomings, what are the things that we need to um, be looking at when we attempt to apply this multi-stakeholder model to uh, something as, as more, you know, hardcore as, as security? Um, so that is sort of my jumping off point. Tatiana, I thought I'd ask you if you have any initial comments to make and then we'll turn it to the panelists for s sort of a first round of comments. Uh, thank you, Sally. I would like to turn it to the panel as soon as possible, but I would like to um, say as well that as a moderator and as someone who participated in the organizing team of the plenary, it was a big surprise for me that governments mm. came up as, mm -hmm. as one of the leading stakeholders. I wasn't expecting it. We were not expecting it when we um, um, uh, put up the poll this scaling exercise. So I would really like to give, the, give it to the panel now mm. and, and, and express your views. Thank you. So I think the question that I'm asking, um, and, and we can go in a number of different directions, but this first question of, is the multi-stakeholder model relevant to issues of cybersecurity? And then the follow-on question I would ask is, uh, if so, um, where do we see it being applied today? What are, can we look at some practical examples of where that's happening now? And John, I'm going to turn it over to you. If everybody could introduce themselves, okay. that would be great. I'm John Crane, um, senior security geek at ICANN. Um, so if you look at organizations like ICANN, we're always talking about the multi-stakeholder model. Multi-stakeholder, when it's used in the sense of everybody can participate, works really well for things like policy development. Mm -hmm. Often in the security world, you're not talking about developing policies, you're often talking about being practitioners and actually doing something operational. So when it comes down to operational matters, what you want is the people that have the knowledge and the capability to actually make operational things take part. Now that's not just governments, right? The internet is not run by governments. Uh, much of the infrastructure is run by private industry. Much of the expertise is held outside governments. But governments, of course, have a very important role. One of the parts of government from a public safety perspective is, of course, law enforcement. Right. So, you know, in a law enforcement matter, of course, they take the lead dealing with that. But often, they need to bring in other stakeholders. Um, you know, in our world, if they're dealing with things like botnets that are going to affect the domain name system, they're going to need to bring in the experts on reverse engineering the botnets, but they're also going to need to bring in the people from the DNS industry that can actually affect the system. Mm -hmm. So in the policy realm, I think, and discussing what are the policies around cybersecurity, uh, issues like human rights, etc., that's where you, and now that's affected, that's where you bring in the full multi-stakeholder model, if you like. But when you actually get down to practical elements of dealing with security issues, you have to narrow that down to the people that can actually have a practical influence. Patrick. Yeah, uh, Patrick Feldstrom from uh, NetNode, um, also secure, sort of security person, mostly working with robustness and resilience. Um, also chair of the Security and Stability Advisory Committee um, of ICANN. Let me continue on what John said and sli express it slightly differently. Um, it's hard to disagree with what you're saying. I'm not. The, if we think about how internet is, 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 is constituted, it is compared to in the old world where we had sort of the telco and, and the, the monopoly and we had a, a wire from there and we had a phone that we got from them and we, we could use the services they provided for us. They even gave us electricity that the phone was using. Um, that world is gone, so nowadays on the internet, 
you have multiple entities where each one is bringing something together. So we have multiple parties. Some bring fiber, some bring sort of SISPs, uh, some give services to others. The, the way the internet works is that each one of those have to be, take a responsibility for the functionality of whatever they bring to the table. And that's how internet works. And that is a different way of explaining, from my perspective, what John just said, is that whoever runs their, or whoever brings something that builds the internet must ensure that that works. So that has to do with the responsibility, and that is absolutely not multi-stakeholder. It is up to whoever runs it to make sure that it continues to run. And so governments do certain things and private sector do other things. But then of course we have certain kind of policies that we need to sort of live up to. And those exist specifically in two forms from my perspective. One has to do with more contractual perspective, contracts between in the market economy and also norms that we are playing along in the society. And those are things that are very much already today are developed in a multi-stakeholder fashion. We know how to do that. But then we have another portion, and that has to do with the form of legislation that actually governments, um, which, which government um, uh, write. And they are the ones that have to come up with this legislation which both, for example, give the ability for law enforcement to do certain things and for private sector to not do certain things. And that's also where we have the human rights. Human rights are promises between states on what they are, going to, what they are supposed to do within their jurisdiction. So that's why I agree that governments do have a very big role there because that is where you have the fundamental basic uh, the, the sort of legislation that governments have to do to fo either force people to do things or prohibit people to do other things. And it's, it's quite hard to also have a true multi-stakeholder process there as well, even though many governments are trying to do an outreach process. It's not really multi-stakeholder, it's more like an outreach process. So that's why I think we have these three different buckets. Operations, each one have to take care of whatever they do. Norms and other kind of things, more CSR-like, that can be multi-stakeholder, and then governments have to do their part. I think that's a very interesting framework, and I would like to, to come back on that. George, if I might, I just want to make sure we didn't lose Dominique. Is, is she still here? Yes, I'm here. I'm sharing my video, but I, I don't think you can see it. We cannot see you. So, Dominique, if I might, um, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, to come from, from your perspective at GSMA and, and whether you think the multi-stakeholder model is um, fit for purpose when it comes to issues related to security. Sure, and thanks for letting me join remotely. And I'm sorry I can't be with you this week. Um, just perhaps building a little bit um, on what everyone said so far, uh, we, um, we absolutely support the multi-stakeholder model, but also acknowledge that different experts have different roles to play in cybersecurity. Obviously from um, the mobile industry, we're often the first ones to uh, deal with issues, whether it has to do with content on our networks or our networks in general, or indeed handsets and, and various endpoint devices. We're often the first ones to, to uh, get notified of that as well as to have to deal with the issue. So we actually uh, strongly believe in the multi-stakeholder model because it takes um, all actors to contribute to, uh, to solving this issue um, in, in a variety of different ways. And I think governments tend to focus a bit more on their role, which is focused right now and, and very much in the media on protecting public safety. Uh, safety. Um, and while that is one of many, many aspects, we think that it's a collaborative aspect um, to cybersecurity that's really important. So we kind of see it in four different buckets. Um, one is about protecting consumers, and this includes education as well, um, to have appropriate legal, legal frameworks and resources available for consumers to understand what they're actually doing um, on our networks and, and with our devices. And part of that includes protecting consumer privacy, too. Um, but we do feel strongly about protecting public safety. But again, because oftentimes we're ones that are, um, that are right there in the forefront, we, we have to work quite closely with law enforcement on this. And that requires a proportional legal framework, too, which I think is an important component to all of this as well. Um, and then finally, protecting network security and device security is something that um, we take quite seriously. I, I would suggest that maybe later when we talk about multi-stakeholder model, um, one of the things we can talk about is uh, counterfeit devices um, and handset theft and sort of how we approach that from a very multi-consumer point of view as well as a multi-stakeholder point of view. 
Um, but it's also important to have sort of, you know, specific um, and appropriate uh, processes for this. That includes, um, you know, a CERT, a security incident response team, a way of sharing information and also securing um, the value chain and, and the mobile ecosystem. Uh, and that includes public-private partnerships, obviously, in order to make that happen. So overall, I would just say that I absolutely um, come from a point of view, and the mobile industry comes from a point of view, that multi-stakeholderism is important, but understanding that there are different roles to play. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And thanks you. for the video working. Sorry, yes, I didn't see Yes, it's nice videos. to see your face. <laughs> so, thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Dominique. Um, George, do you want to weigh in on this question? Hi, uh, George Christie from the University of Warwick uh, and the Cyber Policy Centre uh, in the UK. Uh, so, yes, multi-stakeholderism, um, it's a slippery concept, I think. Um, we've Each of us given our own definition already uh, of what it is. Um, now, it, we can take the all-encompassing uh, definition. Uh, that means that all stakeholders must be involved all of the time. I don't think that's what anybody's saying. Um, so, you know, I think the key here is to be quite nuanced about when we use it and how we use it. Uh, of course, the relevant stakeholders should be involved uh, across the different levels uh, that we operate in terms of cybersecurity policy. But, but again, cybersecurity, what's that? And at, at what levels does that operate? You know, we can't just say cybersecurity. It's cybercrime, it's attacks against information systems, it's cyber defense, it's cyber offense. Uh, and certainly we don't expect to see civil society uh, representatives, for instance, uh, turning up uh, at the US uh, headquarters for cyber storm, for instance, or, or, or you know, cyber warriors, et cetera, right? So we, we've got to take that into account. Um, it's a relevant concept, uh, of course it is, and I think, but it has to be broken down. So, you know, what are the alternatives? How does it embody itself? Well, we see lots of networks operating around cybersecurity. Uh, Public-private partnerships is the new buzzword, uh, probably as slippery as, uh, <laughs> as multi-stakeholderism. Um, there are many thousands <laughs> of public-private partnerships within cyber itself. What does that mean? How do they work? I mean, I think there's some relevant models here, uh, but I think we need to get down to that level to actually understand multi-stakeholderism better in cyber and whether it's relevant or not. Um, so there are public-private partnerships that have worked very well, um, there's some that haven't, okay, that are very well documented, whether in Europe or, or elsewhere. Uh, so I think for me, uh, to start with, I think we need to engage with the people in the room here who are involved in public-private partnerships, networks, or multi-stakeholder fora, um, to have a conversation about how it works practically um, and who should be involved. Um, I'll leave it there for now, but I'm sure that's where hopefully the discussion will, will go. Absolutely. Thank you. And next, and, but last but not least, I'll turn to my colleague, uh, Robin Wilton, who might have been partially responsible for the, the start of the government discussion the other day. <laughs> so Robin, over to you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not often you get the luxury of having a second bite um, <laughs> at something like this, especially when it has generated such lively discussion. Um, so I think it's important first to look back to the context of yesterday's discussion. Um, I tend to think of cybersecurity as those aspects of digital, the digital world that overlap with the critical elements of national infrastructure. Now, that's a, that's a narrower definition than most people use, but I think what it does is it clarifies part of the role of government. And my opening comment yesterday was that I think that governments have a responsibility for citizen safety, and as Dominique said, public safety is one of the buckets here. But governments also have a role in keeping the critical national infrastructure available and resilient. At least that's a responsibility that they might pass to others. So they might not be the operational um, owners of that, but if the critical national infrastructure fails, um, Who's, who else's responsibility is that in a nation state? So let's make it a bit, bit less abstract. Think of the Mirai botnet. That almost took a country offline. 
So one view of cybersecurity is that that government had a responsibility to ensure the resilience of its national infrastructure, and that national infrastructure came under threat. Okay. But is it up to the government to ensure that bots can't be created? Probably not. That's someone else's responsibility. Um, it might be the responsibility of the product designers to ensure that your connected toaster can't be subverted and turned into a bot. And then you come to the incentives on those commercial providers. And as someone else remarked yesterday, if you're developing a toaster, you have to pay for the development of that toaster and recoup your cost by selling it. But you don't suffer the financial damage when your toaster, as part of a botnet, attacks some other country's infrastructure. So there's no financial incentive for you to be worried about someone else's national infrastructure. So there's a misalignment of incentives there, which I think the multi-stakeholder approach has a role in correcting. Well, I Robin, I think you've done it again. I can see Patrick is um, he's, he's already squeezing his face here. So yeah. Patrick, I'm going to let you weigh in. Let's make this interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, there were a couple of things you had said there, which, which I think is interesting. You said, for example, taking a country offline. I don't know what that means. That's the first thing. And you also said governments are responsible to ensure that critical infrastructure something I don't remember exact wording stays we use online I stays think online or whatever yeah. it is it's like here in Estonia they have made a decision on what is critical we have not in Sweden so we don't even know what critical infrastructure is so I don't understand that part of your statement either one of the reasons why Estonia have been able to survive is because they have made a decision of, they have made an agreement probably in some kind of process which might like look like multi-stakeholder what is important Given that everyone knows what is important, it has been easier in Estonia than, for example, in Sweden for each individual player to make the correct decisions so that things work. Right. But the actual, the actual operations, to go back to what John, John said, you said originally, the actual actions later on is something that each individual player is doing. And, and that is not a multi-stakeholder process either. So yes, so I think, so it's not the case that I disagree with you, but I hear some of the terms that you are using are also things that are discussed. Exactly like you were saying regarding multi-stakeholder, we don't really know, and which you also said, are we really talking about multi-stakeholder or are we talking about private-public partnerships or triple helixes or like whatever? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's good to know that national approaches differ. And to be honest, I didn't know that Sweden had that approach of simply not defining what CNI is. So for example, in the UK, I know that there is a government forum in which participants from the energy industry, telco, transport, pharmaceuticals, um, uh, drainage, are invited to contribute to the discussion about how to keep the national infrastructure resilient and operational. I, I was not aware that that wasn't the case in other countries, and that's, that's interesting to know. But if you do have that approach, um, so for example, the, the, the energy industry, it's, it's a long time in the UK since that was a government-owned and run thing. It's privatized. But if the country's energy infrastructure ceases to function, it's the government who will tend to get it in the neck. And so they are a stakeholder. They have a stake in keeping that thing running. Go ahead, John, yeah. And another term, or, or, or another statement, which was interesting, was that it's about national critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And th that sort of gives the idea that infrastructure stays within national boundaries. And of course, as we all know, it doesn't. So, you know, when, when you talk about cybersecurity, you can't really bound it by the national infrastructure. It, it may be infrastructure of national importance, but it may also be corporate infrastructure. Some of the, some of the major um, pieces of infrastructure there are used by the economy, but they're not built in, in the sense of national infrastructure. Um, and I think that's a good definition, but it's only one definition. And, but I think one of the interesting things you've said, which does count across all of this is about the, the imbalance of the economic incentives. Um, I, I think in both cases that counts. But you know, a, a lot of places around the world 
a lot of governments and, and also non-governmental people haven't quite grasped the concept that the network doesn't follow those nice, pretty national boundaries that everybody right. likes. Right. Well, and it strikes me, and then I think we'll turn it over uh, to the room here. Um, it strikes me that um, attacks that we've seen recently, WannaCry or um, even the Mirai bot, where you might have had critical infrastructure impacted, however that might be defined, the solutions were still far beyond national borders, right? So it was, um, while, while the government certainly, I think, took interest in these attacks, and everyone was talking about it, the solutioneering for that was a global network of, of people working together and not directed by the government or otherwise um, a single national solution set. I mean, is that a fair reading? Pop in here. For no, a there is Dominique. Oh, Dominique, come on in. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's really weird to see me in, on the large uh, screen. <laughs> but um, uh, <laughs> Sally, you brought up something that uh, is really interesting and something that I kind of think we should cover. It's not just the problem is for us, you know, a lot of our operators run national and international networks. And yet when we go into different countries, there are different concerns, different legal frameworks, different stakeholders different approaches culturally, technically, whatever it might be, to, um, to that partition, particular national boundary. I'm not saying, you know, internet boundary, but national boundary. And that we have different challenges in different countries, whether or not, you know, the attack comes from five or 10 or 50 different servers all over the world. So one of the real challenges is to kind of see how we can seek sort of global agreement and, and global um, uh, participation, right, in order to solve the problem at local level. And that's something that personally I don't think can be achieved through like one global treaty, but um, needs to be taken into consideration um, when you go into a country. And perhaps we can talk about that a little bit more when you have, when we talk about sort of um, case studies a little bit later. So Tatiana, should we uh, open this up to the to the room? Oh, I, I see we already yes, have. Yes, I few already comments. see several interventions, so we don't even need to pose the questions. That's Please right. Fine. <laughs> Just okay. makes the moderator's the job easy. Tapani tai vain flerkunenkin fontia Finland. I'm missing a little here because, as far as I can tell, one of the one, if not the main point of stake, multi-stakeholders is that the stakeholders have different interests that are occasionally even conflicting. And none of them has, uh, by definition, the right one. We cannot assume that the government is in the right. To pick an extreme example, in a totalitarian government, their security interest is to make sure that their citizens are not too secure in their own communications. <laughs> and uh, coming to the point of whether this is a policy or implementation decision, as Lawrence Lessig said, that code is law, and it applies here as well. Implementation decisions, standards, technical implementations have direct policy implications like, obviously, anonymity, encryption, stuff like that. So I think that is the main reason for a multi-stakeholder approach here, just to make sure that all stakeholders have their interests taken into account. Uh, Tapani, can I ask you a question to clarify your statement? Because, uh, for example, Patrick was talking about um, multi-stakeholder approach on the policy-making level, but not on the operational level and not on the implementation or enforcement level. So basically, is your statement also coming from, like, there would be a problem or we have to take into account different interests, anonymity, encryption on the implementation level. This is why we have to have multi-stakeholder on the policy level. So you're basically agreeing with Patrick on this. Well, I can't really disagree with Patrick on anything when we get into <laughs> detail, except but only what is important, so that we have to take this account on every level. So, ah, so on every so level. That, yeah. Please. My, my question actually builds a little bit on the last one. I think there's, there seems to be a general consensus that governments either should take the lead role or else should have a major role in terms of the policy making and also the, the operation of cybersecurity. But if you look, say, at recent case studies in, in the US and UK and probably in other European countries of governments stockpiling and deploying zero day tax in order to access um, data held on, on terminal devices, do you think that, that those kind of actions undermine the argument that governments ought to be the solely lead responsible and whether they, that undermines the possibility of having a true multi-stakeholder approach in cybersecurity. 
I will bounce this question back to Robin. Robin, do you have anything to comment? Because I believe that Tapani had more or less the same point in the beginning of his statement. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> where, should, where did I sign up for this role? <laughs> Um, I, I, it's, a, it's a very good question, and I think what you've described there, where you have governments who are um, stockpiling things that potentially add to the vulnerability of citizens and, and their devices and systems, I think that's a macrocosm of a tension that we saw um, after the Snowden revelations, where a single government agency was responsible both for advising the government and citizens about how to secure their systems, but also for developing the techniques to crack those systems and exploit the resulting intelligence. Um, and that's a tension which arises out of functions of government. Um, most governments, I suspect, see it as part of their responsibility to ensure that they can collect intelligence. Um, so how, how do you compartmentalize those in a way that they that, that reduces that tension. Um, and I, I don't think there's an easy technical answer. So I, a couple thoughts that I think Patrick went away and George perhaps as well. Um, one of the, the readings um, before this uh, session um, was this notion of uh, the Internet Society and others have, have worked on together on this notion of collaborative security. This idea of how you approach uh, the development of of security all the way up and down these, these layers that I think Patrick was talking about, whether it's operational all the way up to um, the laws and the, and the legislation and the norms. But to this question on stockpiling, I think one of the, the key principles of that collaborative security framework is that we approach security from the perspective of fostering confidence and pr protecting opportunities, that we uh, the, the fundamental properties and values of the internet should be the core guide for our approach to security. So I think what, and then the final one is, is that while you may act, or not the final, but one of them is if though you may act locally, your actions in a networked environment have global repercussions. And I think this is what we're seeing when we talk about stockpiling and, and this notion of uh, vulnerability, um, and all of the rest is that it, it has implications on the globe and on these global networks. We are part of a system. Um, and so I think as we encourage whoever's taking these actions at whatever level, whether it's operational or whether it's at the level of norms, to operate from a certain set of approaches and, and for that to guide the approach to security, not this notion of locking things down or hoarding or protecting. So just... Uh, you. A, a potential response to that. Patrick and then George? So it sounds, it sounded maybe like if I am sort of against multi-stakeholder process <laughs> and stuff, I'm definitely not. And people that know me know that I'm actually <laughs> like it a lot. So anyway, so just because I talked about these buckets, like the governments that implement whatever kind of legislation is needed and also sort of is needed for multiple definitions of need, and down to pure operation that individuals or individual organizations are doing. Everything can, of course, be run by the evolution of norms and policies sort of in the center bucket. And if that is done, my view is that if that, if that is done in a proper way, then you will sort of taint the other processes. For example, if it is the case that people have certain interests for certain products, then of course the market will develop those kind of products, they will be deployed, because otherwise they will not be able to sell anything. So, so a good multi-stakeholder process turns into a certain flavor of market economy later on, even though the actual market itself when operating is not a multi-stakeholder one. So the multi-stakeholder process can influence the other, the other ones. Mm. So it, it, it goes back to the question of what, multi what we, do we mean by multi-stakeholder, where we, where we have different definitions. George. Uh, just to clarify as well, I mean, yes, I'm very much for multi-stakeholderism. I just wish people would discuss it in context and give specifics in terms yes. of where it's useful, uh, in a sense. I think it is. We need accountability. We need transparency. Uh, certainly, civil society has always got a role there in whatever the government is doing. I think that's uh, a, a salient point, uh, probably a, a, a slightly separate issue. Uh, my question is in terms of the multi-stakeholder model, where is the space within which that can happen? Uh, where can it happen systematically? 
And, and there, where we come to cybersecurity, we don't see, we see many spaces where civil society can interact, right? So for standards agencies, technical standards agencies uh, that claim to be multi-stakeholders, certainly there's civil society representation in there. But we need to look closer at representation and then uh, the power of, of civil society to be able to achieve uh, their aims, right, uh, within those. Uh, so when we talk about multi-stakeholder, we need to be clear about what, what are the roles of the stakeholders within the fora uh, that we're looking at. Um, and I think we really need to get down to some specifics, you know, uh, examples um, of where that's happening, where it's happening well or where it's not happening so well. What are the lessons that we've learned so far? Um, I'm sure people in this room are engaged in those very processes. We've got people here from ICANN in, in Sweden here at the national level, Robin uh, uh, as well. As an academic, I have a broad overview of these things. I can talk about various uh, European-based institutions, but you know, uh, cybersecurity is global as we, we, we hear uh, yes. every day uh, and should hear every day. Uh, so I think for me, uh, of course, I support multi-stakeholderism. Um, I think the IGF works very well. It's got a specific function for me, okay? Um, but uh, yeah, it'd be nice to expand that discussion to the audience as well. And that's where I think I would like to take the discussion, but I think we have a few more comments, a remote comment. Uh, yes, I think we do have a couple of remote comments. Uh, the first comment was probably, I mean, now I think we are making it too late. It referred to the first part of our discussion and said why we are talking so much about the governments. And I believe that we have an answer to this and I, I, will, I might grab this opportunity to answer because we talked a lot about this surprisingly yesterday at the cybersecurity plenary and the results of these discussions were surprising as well because many people were supporting the leading role of the governments. And we have a question from, from a remote participant. Um, Farzan Abadi is asking what is multi-stakeholderism? <laughs> uh, issue governance should be in place. Being religiously multi-stakeholder does nothing. Uh, right now, before we move to the, um, back to our panelists, are there any questions or comments from the floor? Um, for, for, from you, because I, I would really like to ask a question, if I may, um, a question um, about public-private partnerships. What really strikes me many times is that we equal multi-stakeholder with public-private partnerships. Should we really do this? Because for me, public-private partnerships is industry, government mostly. So are we kind of broadening the definition of public-private partnerships? to multi-stakeholder, are we making this equal, or this, you know, partial, partially multi-stakeholder out of sudden becomes multi-stakeholder? And I want to make a quick comment for Dominic. Dominic, I'm watching you on a big screen, so any time where you want to intervene, just raise your hand, so no worries. Thank you. Sally, back to you. Sure. Uh, let's take up that question of public-private partnerships. Is that um, narrowing the field or is it broadening the field? It's, what's the place for public-private partnerships in the cybersecurity discussion? Sure. So, so it does narrow the field mm -hmm. and we come back to the question of, you know, what's the actual thing that's happening? So if, you, if you're in the operational world, a public-private partnership or a partnership between, or even a private-private partnership, right? But partnerships between the affected bodies and the bodies able to make effects can, can be very appropriate. Yeah, so, it, so it is scaled down, if you like, but with, with a purpose. Um, so I, I do see it as a smaller. I violently agree with scaling down depending on the area and I believe that it also goes back to the comment from remote participant right. that being religiously multi-stakeholder just simply doesn't help. Yeah. George, I wanted to come back to this point that you, uh, that you made earlier about um, perhaps it's time to get specific, perhaps it's time to, get, uh, to be pragmatic about um, what are some of the the models or the the um, what what are some what is some of the work that's out there that is not, maybe not government driven but that is core to the security of the internet? What are some of the examples of maybe it's multi stakeholder, maybe it's public private partnership? But these there's like I said yes or in reflecting yesterday, there seemed to be this emphasis on laws and procedures and government driven solutions. But I think it's important to put on the table what some of the uh, real world 
uh, work is that's happening um, to to contribute to the cybersecurity environment. So, George, maybe may I start with you, and then we can open it up for for that discussion. Yeah, sure. I mean, in terms of them not being government driven, I mean, by their very nature, public private partnerships mm. has some element of sure. <laughs> of public body participation. So it's very difficult to to find uh, fora that aren't mm. that don't have involvement. Um, I mean, a, a typical one that, that's cited, for instance, in the UK is the, the CISP um, network, which you might be familiar with, uh, well, not, <laughs> by the look on your face, uh, which is basically a, a platform um, that's paraded as a good practice model for uh, government uh, and uh, industry to come together to share information. And information sharing seems to be quite critical here. How do we share information? How do we incentivize the private sector with, that works to a very different logic, a com competitive logic, an economic logic, a profit-making logic, to share their information with essentially uh, what they see as their main competitors, okay? Um, now, what they've tried to do in that specific partnership uh, is to bring in all the relevant government bodies, including intelligence uh, services, GCHQ, mm. um, the cabinet office, with big players, uh, corporate players, ICT players, and. It, the membership has expanded. Uh, I'm not sure what the number is uh, right now. Uh, but obviously then trust becomes a critical issue for this sort of model to work. How do you build trust? Um, and, and then we come down to separate sort of governance models. Uh, so within uh, the CISP, there's a fusion cell where people co-work. So industry and government um, analysts co-work to gather intelligence and pass that intelligence back uh, to private uh, sector and to uh, government officials, okay? Uh, that seems to be a fairly effective way of working. Um, I mean, I've got other examples in terms of the operational aspects and mm -hmm. the, the Joint Cybercrime Action Task Force, for instance, at uh, the European Cybercrime Center, but we can come on to that in a minute. But we're getting into sort of concrete um, examples here. I'm not saying there isn't a problem with CISP. There, there are various issues around CISP uh, in terms of who shares and when they share and, mm -hmm. and you know, what sort of corporate uh, bodies participate, who can, you know, uh, who's excluded, etc. But uh, it's just one example. Good. Thank you. Patrick. Yeah, to continue on what we just heard and trying to give a couple of practical examples, I think also we have to differ between, um, for example, um, uh, the government or some agency create a platform uh, by which information can be shared and then given the information that is shared by the trusted parties who are the participants can then choose who they are cooperating with as John is saying if, for example during during an incident during an accident or something to be able to solve this specific issue so that's where you might have sort of a public private partnership regarding the tools but then the actual work is done between sort of even a subset of the participating parties it's also the case that, of course, it sounded a little bit alarming that we in Sweden don't know what is critical. <laughs> but, the, but because we, of course, do have the same kind of cooperation bodies and tools that, that you just listed, that you just brought up. But what we have seen in Sweden is that specifically regarding cybersecurity, it is very difficult to know what is critical because the various different kind of incidents are very different. Right. So, for example, we had a big um, uh, storm going through Sweden in 2007. Uh, that uh, brought out power for like large portions of Sweden for, for, for multiple days. And what we saw that the ones that needed, uh, needed communication, the ones that we gave special radios and national roamings with SIM cards, guess, uh, and one can guess who they were that actually got those special radios, those were the drivers of the trucks with diesel. They were the most critical sort of people in Sweden during those weeks. And the only person that unfortunately died of the storm were the electricians that tried to restore it clearly because they could not communicate. So after that, we do have a system where the electricity and the telco system, uh, uh, sectors can share information also cross sectors so they know and cooperate when restoring electricity or cell phone network. One thing that we're, another example, so that is one kind of collaboration. The other thing that is, when, what I'm, when, I, when I say we don't know in Sweden what is critical is, for example, we had a terrorist attack, like it seems to be popular to have that. We also had one in Sweden some, some weeks ago. So what we saw then was that the telecom phone system collapsed. And we have this discussion in Sweden whether it's more important that people can communicate with each other 
which is more like an I am alive system like they have in Japan. That's where they've decided it's more important that people can talk to each other. And by the way, that was the view that Estonia had at least during the attacks in 2007 that I was helping with. Well, in Sweden, it's unclear. It's, it's more important that people can talk to each other or that they can call 112 services. And, and that is a multi-stakeholder discussion. What is really important? So, so the problem for telcos and ISPs is they don't know how to prioritize. They only have the SLAs from the customers and then they have the legislation. So unless there is clarity from the multi-stakeholder community, you don't know how to sort of deal with, with the critical situations in your network. And sometimes these situations are over within 15 minutes. Most attacks are 15 minutes long. You don't have time anymore to communicate with each other and coordinate during an attack. That is something that must be done beforehand. So this is where what I think you're saying is the multi-stakeholder model sets the environment by which the operators, the implementers can make the decisions in the moment. Because as we know, security exactly. is not something where you can sit around and, and have a coffee and decide whether or not you know, the principles apply. You have to be able to work within those principles because there's good consensus on what those are. Tatiana. Uh, I, I see a couple of registration uh, from the audience, but I want to read first, let's just collect them. I want to read a question from one of the remote participants, uh, far as anybody is asking, saying, I have a question to Mr. for Mr. Crane from ICANN. Does he ensure ICANN cybersecurity based on multi-stakeholder model? Do stakeholders make policies and he enforces them? John, I'm, 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 I'm sure you'll be happy to answer this question in a moment, but l let us collect more intervention and then yeah. we will come back to you all. Yeah, uh, thank you. I actually already discussed a little bit with Patrick yesterday about this. Um, my question is about the restrictions on movement of data cross border. Some governments are claiming that by restricting data from moving cross border, data is safer. And this is something that has been implemented, for example, uh, for healthcare data in the, in, in the UK, for example, companies are invited to process data within the UK, healthcare data, in other countries, financial data, some other European countries have it for public data. And I've spoken with people specialized in this issue. Some people tell me uh, that doesn't have any impact on, on security at all, just makes things more expensive. Some other people tell me, actually, maybe if data is kept within a hospital, maybe it's safer. Other people tell me, actually, it's less safe because it's more easily hackable if it's centralized rather than being decentralized. Mm -hmm. So what's your opinion on that? Uh, thank you very much. Are there, are there other questions, other statements, other intervention before we move to... So I think we, I, heard, I heard two questions yeah. then, right? The first question to John on, um, uh, I, did, do you ensure that ICANN security is based on the multi-stakeholder multi model? Do they um, develop yeah. policies and you implement them? So let's, let's be clear here. Um, there, there are different ways of people looking at ICANN. So I, I work for something called the ICANN organization and we have our own security issues because we run networks, et cetera, right? The same thing that every corporation has. So, but then we also have the ecosystem, which ICANN enables the multi-stakeholder model to develop the policies for. And some of those actually have an influence on security issues. Um, what do the policies around TLDs look like, et cetera? Th those are multi-stakeholder process development things, and then there's the implementation of those that then may be put through SLAs, et cetera. But the actual policy behind those, that is a multi-stakeholder model with input from governments. When it comes to the cybersecurity issues, such as, such as um, for example, how the DNS um, abuse is handled, et cetera, we have a public safety working group inside the government advisory committee, but then we also have many other groups that look at these kind of issues. And whenever there's a policy developed within ICANN, it goes to public comment. So literally anybody can get involved in those discussions. So when you're talking about the ecosystem where ICANN has a role in policy development, absolutely that is multi-stakeholder. Uh, John, can I ask you a question? The fact that public safety working group at ICANN is inside governmental advisory committee, does it say something about the roles of the government? I, I think it 
possibly does. Um, so that group, it's not the only group that talks to security issues. For example, we have a gentleman here who yeah, shares have. a committee. <laughs> I was going to say, I wonder um, if he would weigh in. <laughs> but it does say something about how government sees their role and the fact mm. that they have formed a group, right? I, we didn't form the group. They have formed a group that deals with public mm. safety concerns and that they consider oddly or not that law enforcement is a go government agency, right? It's a, gov it's a government service. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it says something about how they see that, that they've taken the time to set up a working group to deal with public safety issues. Patrick, and then I'm going to turn to Dominique as well on this question of movement of data, but I'll let you kick it off. Yes, to address some of the things you were yes. saying, I think it boils down to what you mean by security. Because I think a lot of the, lot of the legislation and rules we have regarding privacy also have to do with the norms in the society and the fact that we have different norms. And some of the norms are, of course, implemented in legislation. So I think some of these cross-border things, if we, ignore, if, we, if we just talk about, is it more secure to, move, to have data locally instead of moving it to another country? I think that is, can be viewed, if I exaggerate a little bit more, as a consumer rights issue that you as a person that is described, you, are, uh, you expect whoever you give the information to, to treat the information in a certain way and not give it away more than under certain ways. That is, sort of, that is sort of the ecosystem within which you are living. And what the governments then are doing is that they say, okay, one way of making you feel more, 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 more secure is to ensure that the data stays within sort of the ecosystem where people share the same norms. So that is one way of looking at security. Regarding storing data in, in the central place instead of decentralized, that is, goes back to what I said, that each entity that is responsible for something, for example, storage or a service, they have to do their own risk assessment and see on contingency plans and whatever. And normally on the internet, redundancy and robustness is the best thing. So replaceability, if you store it in one place, that's good, but you need to make sure that you can restore whatever you are doing, given that that storage is going away. So that's a risk, so it's, it's not possible. So the important thing there, from my perspective, is that there is a risk assessment done based on whatever is provided, not what the result of the risk assessment is. Thank you. Dominique, do you want to weigh in on this from a sort of industry GSMA perspective? Yeah, sure. Um, and mostly I, I do want to say that it's my colleagues in privacy who are much more expert at this oh. than, um, than I am. But I think it's, you know, I just want to support what Patrick said. And I think it's really important that um, we understand that obviously there is a trade-off, but there are, national, there are national and international sort of laws and mechanisms to ensure it. But I'm sure you've had other discussions throughout the last couple of days at um, Eurodig, but for us, especially for the mobile industry, cross-border data is really important for, um, for the industry um, and also for what Patrick said in terms of security, not to have a centralized system, but to have a fairly robust um, system uh, network across different, uh, different countries as well. But obviously, you know, we see a lot of economic benefits to this as too, in terms of innovation and business development. Um, but I would say, uh, sort of watch this area from the GSMA, and my colleagues probably will follow up a bit more because this is such a hot topic right mm. now. I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. Tajin, um, do you have more from the remote? Yeah, I, I do, but just a comment. Uh, I don't know if we better to start discussion on this or just close the discussion on the government. So, John further to what you say, the comment is, it seems like governments are taken more seriously at ICANN regarding security issues than other stakeholders. Uh, do you want to respond to this? Um, I, I think everybody's taken seriously. I mean, if, I mean there is always this impression um, that, you know, if the government says something, it has to be that way. If you look at um, discussions around, for example, um, access to um, registration data and who is, <laughs> if that was the case, we would have had a solution. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad solution, but we would have had one years ago. But I mean, that is an issue where there are issues of security, but also privacy. And that conversation is highly active. Um, and the community has to figure out a solution there and that really is a case of a multi staker process where all the different views have to come in at some point hopefully a sensible solution will come out and then 
we as the workers, the worker bees, will then go and implement that in some way. So I, I, I think the answer is that they are taken seriously, but so are all the other areas. And if you've ever been to an ICANN meeting and watched the communications between various parts of the Government Advisory Committee, and I know there's people from the PSWG here, and for example, the registries, the registrars, the at-large, which you know often talks about privacy issues, et cetera, and trademarks, people, you know, everybody's there, and everybody gets to get their say. It's fascinating. So maybe we will see it soon as yet another multi-stakeholder uh, example in the public safety or security. Are there any uh, further comments as to what has been said? I'm Luis Fernando Castro from Brazil, from the CGI, the Brazilian Steering, Internet Steering Committee. I'd like to make a brief comment about multi-stakeholder uh, organization that we are. Um, it's very important to have a multi-stakeholder organization because we are not only governmental organization. We have nine members from government, uh, 12 from civil society, academ academia, for, from the market, companies, users. <coughs> and it's very good to have a place to discuss all these kind of problems, including uh, cybersecurity, uh, not in a only uh, way, not with only one point of view. Just to give an example, when we had uh, recently the problem with WannaCry, uh, we invited people from Microsoft and the, the, the head in Brazil for cybersecurity came in our first uh, uh, meeting to explain the problem and what they were doing to, 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 to solve it. And we are very respected and we were named by the government uh, as a technical advisor for all the, the, the subjects related to internet and, and security. And just to, to reinforce the importance of the multi-stakeholder uh, model, maybe most of you are, are following the instability, political instability in Brazil now, maybe we change a president in the, in the next period, but uh, the CGI will remain the same because they are independent politically and financially. That's it's very important uh, what makes a good model. Go ahead, Patrick. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that's, that's a very good model that, that people should have a look at uh, because sharing information in the way that you do it in Brazil in one way, in Sweden we do it slightly differently. And I think each each, and in each country and each group, you should look at what is efficient in your context. Because the good thing with multi-stakeholders is also that when, whenever you have had the discussion or shared information, each party can go back and make a more informed decision of what is right, uh, instead of making a decision just within their own context. Because governments, of course, they want to make decisions that the people are happy with, otherwise they don't, didn't, don't get re-elected private sector want to be able to develop and sell services that actually sell things on the market, um, et cetera. And civil society want also to, of course, know what is, what, and, and we consumers want to buy good products. So each one of us make sort of decisions within our each other context, but the multi-stakeholder information sharing can help each one of us groups, even though we are made the, making the decision individually, that that decision can be more informed and informed by the multi-stakeholder sharing information, where you in Brazil do exactly the way you explain and we do in other ways and other people might do it in other ways. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. I think we have one more intervention. Yes. Hi. Uh, Constantinos Komaitis with the Internet Society. So I have been listening and thanks for the discussion. This has been great. But I was a little bit surprised because I haven't heard any of you mentioning the big elephant in the room, which is encryption. And there is a lot of discussion about encryption, and I think that a lot of people would agree that it, perhaps it is the security issue. So a question to all of the panelists, do you think that the multi-stakeholder model can address the big challenge of encryption? Uh, thank you very much. I think we have roughly like 20 minutes, right, for discussion that could have taken two days. Um, any more? Um, 
interventions. Let's, let's take yes. that one because I do think that could yes. take some time. And I think it is an interesting one um, in light of, because I, I took notes, Patrick, um, in light of sort of the, the tiers that you talked about. There's this idea of the norms, uh, the operational work. Um, but in this instance on encryption, uh, in many ways, the, the technology is, is out of the bag, so to speak. It's, it's running, it's being deployed. The, there are technical principles around end-to-end -end encryption. This is out in the marketplace. It's being used. And it, it feels like this is an instance where the norms or the legislation is now rushing to try to figure out how to keep up or how to work within this in terms of the questions we get from law enforcement and others. So what is the, uh, how do we play this this sort of model out in light of the, the encryption discussion? Uh, George, may I, may I turn it to you or does anybody want to bite on this? Maybe I don't have to put anyone on the spot. You, you can. Patrick's uh, going to bite. I'll, I'll, oh, go ahead, George. Yeah, I mean, is multi-stakeholder make multi-stakeholderism a solution, a potential solution to encryption? Uh, probably not a solution, but I mean, I think different perspectives on encryption need to be heard, obviously, right? Uh, encryption for whom, would, I would ask, right? And in, in that context, I think you just touched upon, uh, you know, some of the conflicts around encryption. You know, inevitably, the broader debate is security versus rights and how we should do encryption, uh, consumer trust, uh, so in that sense, obviously, it's important that everybody, everybody's perspective is heard. Um, unfortunately, I think the broader security context means that some voices uh, will be heard more than others uh, in the current context. But it's precisely why multi-stakeholderism does become more important uh, in terms of trying to achieve uh, the right uh, balance between uh, the security and the rights uh, of, of people online. Um, so, so for me, it's important that we, we do get some perspective on this. Uh, it's clear that there are conflicting interests and that security logics can interfere quite often with, with the privacy and, and data protection uh, logics. Uh, is there a silver bullet or answer to this in terms of a particular forum that we can say will solve the issue? Uh, no, I don't think, I don't think there is. Um, there is some good practice in terms of uh, targeted uh, access uh, as opposed to mass surveillance, uh, which can obviously help uh, towards resolving some of the issues, uh, but it's, 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 it's inevitably a complex issue. Um, there are issues around law enforcement and uh, cyber criminal prosecution, data collection, etc., that have to be addressed. Uh, similarly, uh, obviously, there are issues of privacy and data protection that need to be upheld. Um, so. Yeah, I've probably created more questions than answers, but um, I think it is an important issue that, that stakeholders uh, need, need to be engaged in. I think people are, are adding too many questions and too many issues mm -hmm. under the umbrella of the word encryption. Mm -hmm. I don't see any problem with encryption whatsoever, but, and that's why I'm not talking about it. Instead, there are many other things to talk about. For example, uh, what do you do if it is the case that someone is breaching the rules and the norms that are agreed upon in the society? Uh, for example, by not handing out data which you are supposed to hand out data that you might have encrypted somewhere, and you have someone that in that case is not giving out that data, that to me is a question of following the rules and rule enforcement, which of course then if you don't follow the rules, okay, then it might end up being a question of encryption or de-encryption, but that is sort of just the corollary of the initial problem. Mm. Um, also, the similarly regarding anonymi anonymity, like anonymous for whom? And under what circumstances, within what context. Uh, so I think those are the issues that should be discussed. So I don't really see it so much as an encryption question. So both the ones that are in favor of encryption and the ability to encrypt data, and the ones that don't, I think both of them miss the target. And they should, in, just like broadband. For me, encryption and broadband are two words I don't want to hear in a discussion. I want people to repeat what you just said without using the word broadband. Or repeat mm. what you just said without using the word encryption. Mm. And then it might be a much more interesting discussion. Yeah, go ahead, Robin. Um, this feels like a weird comment to make. Uh, on a panel chaired by someone, one of my colleagues from the Internet Society, in response uh -oh. to a question asked by one of my colleagues from the Internet Society. <laughs> but the Internet Society's position on encryption is very clear. We think it should be the norm. We think that strong encryption should be put at the disposal of citizens. Um, 
because trying not to do so creates all kinds of absurdities. Um, and I, I won't repeat them here, but if you Google a recent article by Cory Doctorow on um, attempts to um, ban or weaken or curtail the use of encryption, you will find about 12 reasons why it's probably unworkable and it certainly leads to some really absurd positions. Um, for instance, how do you stop someone from downloading from another jurisdiction where it is legal a software package that allows them to perform strong encryption? Um, that's just one example, and as I say, he's got about a dozen others, but I, I cannot see that attempt to curtail or ban encryption being fruitful in any way. Hi, John. Yeah, and so, so I've talked to many people on both sides of that discussion, and I, and I agree with Patrick that, you know, talking about encryption and it's just pure, it's all about encryption, doesn't get you anywhere. Of, of course people need to keep their data safe, which is what encryption is about. Um, and there are some real discussions to be had about when appropriate authorities under what rules can get, can get to that data. And when you talk to people, and you do what Patrick says as well, you know, take encryption out of it, and you actually talk to people, for example, on the law enforcement side, they're actually very aware of the fact that if we didn't have encryption, we wouldn't have an internet. You know, we would have no e-commerce. So, you know, a lot of the time you will see these very polar discussions in the press, etc., and sometimes by politicians because they do the sound bites they're told to sound. But when you talk to people that are in the actual world of thinking about this, you'll find that it's much more nuanced. Um, you know, it's not this. Encryption's not the big bad bogeyman for law enforcement, and even access to data is not always the big bad bogeyman for people who are privacy advocates. It's controlled access, etc. Yes, of course. Yeah, th thanks, John. I think that's, that's a really good framing of it. And I have certainly heard um, law enforcement agencies... So I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and obey the Feldstrom rule and talk about this without mentioning the E-word. I have heard law enforcement agencies frame the question like this. There should be no way by which data can be put beyond the reach of a duly served warrant. Okay, and, and I think that's probably a position that you've heard as well. My slight quibble with that, and it's not, a, it's not a black and white thing, but my slight quibble with that is, I think in many ways that imposes a higher obligation regarding digital data than it imposes on data that is put out of reach by other means. So for example, if I write down my own passwords in some code that is understandable to me, but not understandable to anyone else, there is no third party who can be compelled to reveal that data on my behalf. Um, so as I say, I, I think that some of that discussion about law enforcement access imposes a higher burden on the user than for data secured by other means. I'll turn it back to, oh yes, we have another question here and then another one in the back. Actually, yep. just a brief comment here that uh, this, without going to the e-word in literally, that this should be decided in multi-stakeholder fashion. We should not assume that the government has the right thing. I think actually one of the key uh, characteristic or maybe just ideal of a democratic government is that it deliberately limits its own means what it can do. For example, we might agree that the government should not torture people, even if it results in the toppling of the government. Government should fall if they can't live without torturing people. Now, are there issues relating to cybersecurity that government should not be doing, even to protect themselves? Should there be, per se, encryption? Okay, I said the word, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, allowing people to use that, evade even law enforcement in some cases. Should there be, there be absolute right of the law enforcement to be able to get at it? Should people be able to use encryption to overthrow the government in the gov if case the government is bad enough to protect themselves against the government? Where do we draw the lines? Should there be something like that? And I think those are exactly the kind of questions that you have to have with those people in the room and everybody else because we all have opinions on this. Um, for example, I don't want anybody to be able to get my data Ever, I encrypt everything. Um, 
But that's just my opinion, right? So that's exactly why we need a multi-stakeholder approach to some of these discussions. Because I think most of the opinions are valid in certain contexts, and it's when you bring them together and you get to understand each of us' viewpoints that you might come to a solution on this. Might. Uh, we have one more intervention. Good afternoon, Arnold van Rijn from the Dutch government. When I was working on my laptop uh, during lunchtime, um, I didn't notice that my laptop wasn't uh, adjusted to this time zone. So uh, I was living in, an, uh, in one earlier uh, time zone, and I'm so sorry I missed uh, this wonderful panel to, to, to hear what they would say about the multi-stakeholder approach with respect to cybersecurity and combating cybercrime. I'm so sorry. but. Um, I, I have only one question um, before I can elaborate a bit more on that. Did the uh, Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, has that been mentioned as a, a multi-stakeholder platform combating cybercrime? Because I think that's the perfect example where multi-stakeholders do get together to um, come up with concrete solutions regarding problems uh, with respect to cybercrime. It is a platform which has been uh, raised uh, during the last uh, uh, global conference on cyber space in The Hague in 2015. It's now up and running, 60 members, 38 countries, governments, uh, 13 international organizations and the rest private sectors, assisted by a, an advisory board uh, compressed by uh, the technical uh, community and the civil society, and they're working uh, together very closely and very um, uh, productive, I must say. There are already 13 concrete initiatives where they are working together in, in a truly multi-stakeholder setting. And um, a couple of days ago, uh, the uh, Global Forum on Cyber Expertise had its annual meeting, and they had agreed with the upcoming uh, chair for the next GCCS, the Global Conference on Cyberspace in India, to come up with a global agenda on uh, cyber security capacity building. And on top of that, uh, they are working uh, on a roadmap to a, a global good practices in this field. So very clear examples where they are working together. I name a few initiatives um, like uh, internet infrastructure initiatives, which main goal is to uh, uh, assist developing countries in implementing uh, modern security uh, standards like uh, DKIM, DMARC, or DNSSEC. And um, there are many more. But just to uh, give you a, a, a short glimpse of this wonderful work, and uh, I will close with some national initiatives in the Netherlands. We have set up a so-called uh, uh, secure email coalition uh, between the government, uh, the private sector, and the civil society to really urge all the participants to implement um, uh, secure, modern safety standards in order to combat, uh, for example, uh, phishing mails. And next to that, we have a, a, a multi-stakeholder uh, forum on standardization, which main aim or goal is to also implement uh, private organizations and other organizations uh, implementing the uh, so-called safety uh, standards. Um, well, I'll stop here because I can go on forever, <laughs> but at, at least uh, I try to, to, to inform you about uh, all those initiatives which are going on, not only globally, but also nationally, and I think this is the way forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Arnold. Uh, there are quite a few initiatives mentioned indeed, and thank you very much for adding uh, on this. And I also believe that the Netherlands are doing a lot in this field. They are, for example, also a part of Freedom Online Coalition work, Working Group, especially for Internet Free and Secure. Uh, concerning your comment about everything going on the national level, I think you missed some parts of this discussion, but I believe that some of our panelists already commented that it might be different on the national level. It, it might depend on, um, on on the country. Are there any more? Um, so, Tatiana, I'm just looking at the at the time here. Shall we so start I, wrapping up? I think so. And what I, I think I would like to ask the panelists to do is think of your uh, sort of parting thought that you would like to leave the group with, and just going back to 
the session teaser, uh, Reality or Wishful Thinking, a new take on cybersecurity governance and multi-stakeholderism. So with that as our, was our going in question, is the model fit for purpose? What, how does it work in practice when we're dealing with the very real issues of security of the day? Um, I'd like to, to ask each of you, in terms of your parting thought for this group, what would you like people to walk away with? So John, maybe we'll start with you. I'll keep it, I'll keep it short, but I, I, I think, um, yes, the multi-stakeholder model has a role, especially in uh, areas where it involves policy and discussions about what policy should be. But we also need to understand that it's not always the solution. When mm -hmm. it comes down to m operational matters, then it's really about getting the people involved that operate the infrastructure or have specific roles. Patrick. And just like I started by saying, I think we need to have the multi-stakeholder discussion so we agree on what is right and wrong, which is the norms, and then based on that, and with clear such sort of directions from a multi-stakeholder community, it would be much easier to later deal with the operational issues, which I include in the real security work. So no, security is not a multi-stakeholder discussion, but it should be informed by multi-stakeholder discussions. Good. Dominique? Thanks for having me. I also agree. I think um, continuing to have discussions not on encryption, but on policies and on solutions and on even what Arnold was saying on sort of approaches to capacity building um, is absolutely essential. Um, and we've seen today sort of the wide range of topics between, um, well, with everything from, uh, you know, cross-border data flows and encryption, but you know, also from network security point of view, critical national infrastructure, I think we're going to need to continue to have this discussion. Um, I also wanted to just say, to add on to what Arnold was saying, the next global cyberspace conference is the 23rd and 24th of November in India. And I can guarantee that there'll be a lot of different stakeholders there specifically to discuss this issue. So thanks for having me from London. Wonderful. George. Uh, yeah, so to go back to the beginning, I guess. Uh, I think multi-stakeholderism is obviously alive and it's needed, right? I mean, I think uh, it, it offers those different perspectives are needed at the global level. Uh, and one thing we haven't really mentioned is the political significance of multi-stakeholderism uh, around cybersecurity because, because of the many states that actually don't believe in multi-stakeholderism but do believe in bordering digital space. Um, for that very reason, multi-stakeholderism is obviously working and it'd be interesting to find out more about why uh, such platforms, global pa platforms work, uh, why they work at the European and national levels and how they work very well. Uh, but I think also at a broader political level, I think multi-stakeholderism is, is critical going forward for cybersecurity and internet governance both. Robin. So I think rather than just violently agree, um, I will... <laughs> Um, slightly change, tweak the topic, and come back to the question that was raised earlier about cross-border data transfers, because I think there was an aspect of that that we didn't really explore, and that can teach us a lot about um, the, the cybersecurity discussion as well, and that is the privacy aspect. So cross-border data transfers often crop up in the privacy debate. Privacy is a social construct, and as, as Patrick said, it reflects sets of social norms and those norms change from one country to another. So what happens when data crosses from one set of norms to another is that you cross that boundary. And data may be used in ways that don't reflect the social expectations of the person it was about. Well, sometimes those privacy expectations are reflected in laws, sometimes they aren't. Usually what's reflected in laws is a subset of your, your full set of expectations about privacy. And sometimes your privacy expectations are reflected in technology. But technology turns out to be a really clumsy language with which to express something as nuanced as privacy. So that's a long way of saying this has to be a multi-stakeholder discussion because you have to bridge the gap between different sets of social norms, different legal frameworks, and, and clumsy technical implementations, which mean that technology alone cannot fix either the security problem or the privacy problem. 
So there have to be policy makers. There have to be people in the discussion who can, have, who can explore the economic dimension and the economic incentives. Um, so I don't think there is any way to escape the multi-stakeholder model. And as you pointed out in your first comment, because there are inherent conflicts between the incentives of the different parties involved. Well, good. I, for one, am relieved because I, I was nervous coming out of the session the other day that, that governments were going to do security alone. And so I, I think we've, um, we've, we've reopened the box and let more people in. Um, but I actually really appreciate the nuance, which I think is sometimes lost in these discussions about the layers and the roles and the responsibilities that people have depending on their, on their uh, where they sit in the eco space and their responsibilities to, to the infrastructure. So um, I think this was very fruitful. I think my job is to turn it over to Jaren um, quickly. She's the reporter for this session and she's going to walk us through the summary um, bullets that will then be passed on to the secretariat. Yes, that was a different, that was a very difficult task. <laughs> I should confess, but so. Uh, a good multi-stakeholder process is essential, so we need to have a consensus with the audience as well. So if you disagree, please just let us know. Uh, considering how the internet was constituted and works, each party needs to take responsibility to ensure some resilience. Solutions to cybersecurity problems are beyond national borders. We need to bridge that divide. And acting locally might result in global implications. That's why a collaborative approach is important. Anyone disagrees? <laughs> okay. No, I don't see anyone. I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm looking. We have different interests and different economic incentives between the stakeholders. Um, especially with regard to Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. And also we have different logics when it comes to security, privacy, data protection. Uh, having a multi-stakeholder approach is critical, particularly for information sharing, which is an essential element uh, for the industry to share information with their competitors and in order to provide some sort of accountability and transparency. And in that case, role of civil society is also crucial. Uh, although governments seem to take the lead, uh, civil society uh, should take a role to monitor. Here we go, Sally. Governments are going I, to take I'm not the sure lead. we came out with a consensus that governments are always taking the lead. No, no, they seem to take the lead. They That's why I said they, they seem they to take the lead. Might want to take the they lead might or want. strive yeah. to take the lead. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick. Well, it, it, it goes back to what you actually, how you define security. Given right. that countries, including inside the EU, the state is responsible for the protection of the country itself. They have the law enforcement, and they also have signed the human rights, where they promise to protect their citizens. So that is, from some definition of security, they, by definition, must take the lead. Uh, Patrick... Uh, to, to stress things a little I, bit. I, 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 I think I will not argue here, though I think it goes back to your argument that there is no multi-stakeholder in enforcement anyway. Okay, so this is good. We're leaving on um, a note of, um, what's the term? Oh. Is it dissonance? <laughs> okay. But um, this is controversy, that's right, yeah, that's yeah, right. That's Which means that we leave the discussion for another day. It means we can keep going. And one last thing is cybersecurity is a global phenomena that would require uh, cooperation and collaboration. I think we can violently agree, agree with here. that. <laughs> Excellent. I'm just delighted. It's, it's only taken place. Thank you very half. much. I'd like to you. thank. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel. Thank Dominique for coming in remotely. Um, and Tatiana, lovely to work with you once again. Any final statement? Um, 
thank you very much to you, Sally. It was wonderful. Thanks to the panel. And thank you very much, Dominique, for agreeing to um, free your schedule a bit and, and, and be online. And, a spe and big thanks to technical team of Eurodig. It is my third time with a remote speaker uh, and moderator, and it really goes well. Thank you very much. And when we give applause to the panel, please, let's give applause to the technical team as well. Mm -hmm.